Hello and a very warm welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Paul. I'm with everybody's favourite historian on the internet, Mr. Ralph Ellis, uh, and it's a Q and A, and we've mm. got some uh, we've got some brilliant questions, Ralph, lined up for you. Marvellous. Good to be back on your show again, uh, Paul. So yeah, uh, this should be interesting. I don't know anything about the questions, so no. this is straight from the top. We'll see what yes. happens. Brilliant. Okay, so let's get straight in with it. We've got. We've got about 20 odd questions to answer here. All oh, right, I'll yeah. try and keep it brief then. <laughs> yeah, possibly we might have to kind of condense your answers down to about three or four minutes to try and... Yeah, yeah. I'll keep an eye questions. on the clock and see see how we do on that. Brilliant, okay. Well, we've got a couple of questions uh, related to current events, so I thought we'd start there. So the first question comes in from a Mr. Phil Roberts, and he has said... There's an ancient atlas or map of Antarctica showing no ice or snow, but only lush green scenery. Is there any more evidence to show this? And was Australia under ice like Antarctica at some point in ancient history? I think uh, it's about the, the Perry, is it the Perry, the Perry Rice, Rice map? map? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, no, Australia wasn't under ice. It was too far north. Um, so I don't think uh, Australia was ever under ice, uh, even during the ice ages. The ice sheets never reached that far north, although it would have been slightly colder, of course. Um, the maps are interesting. I've never seen any decent refutation of those maps. So many claims have been made about the maps that they show Antarctica without ice, you know, as if someone mapped uh, the coastline of Antarctica when it didn't, because it, it normally has, you know, a ring of ice around it. It's got floating ice sheets. Uh, and so it's not obvious where uh, Antarctica as a landmass actually starts. And yet someone appears to have not only known about Antarctica in uh, I think this was the 16th century. Yeah, 1500s, yeah. Yeah, 1500s. Um, but also managed to map it as if it had no ice on it, as if they had a much earlier map. Now, the ice sheets would have been smaller during the Holocene maximum. I don't know how much smaller, but the Holocene maximum, which is about 8,000 years ago, uh, was, was two degrees warmer than now. Um, so it was actually much warmer 8,000 years ago. This is during the uh, African humid period, they call it, when the Sahara Desert turned green and fertile and it had rivers and lakes and um, wildlife all over it. This was 8,000 years ago. So, you know, things were much warmer then. <clears throat> this was due to increased obliquity. Uh, the obliquity was uh, substantially more than it is now. Uh, which means you get more heating in the uh, high latitudes, north and south. Um, so, but that would mean that someone was mapping those regions 8,000 years ago, which is currently not possible under classical uh, history and archaeology. But as I say, I've not seen anyone refute those particular maps. They seem to be genuine. They seem to indicate, you know, the coastline of Antarctica. And that fits in, I have to say, with my rather speculative uh, analysis of Avebury. You know, in that talk we did a few weeks ago, we were talking about Avebury was highlighting uh, land masses down in the southern latitudes. That goes along very nicely with that. Um, OK, it's speculative, but, you know, here we have two independent pieces of information that people were journeying down in the uh, southern latitudes interesting isn't it mm, very interesting yeah i don't suppose you've come across some photos that have recently appeared on the internet um i think it was thomas sheridan who shared some on his beyond 313 group page um and these photos are allegedly taken from scott's expedition of antarctica in 1912 and uh, they show statues, structures, um, pyramids, all sorts of um, 
interesting things that uh, have long been mm -hmm. rumoured to be on Antarctica. Unfortunately, these days, it's so easy to Photoshop things that it's impossible mm -hmm. to know if they're genuine or not. Have you come across those at all? No, I haven't. And I would be very suspect because that uh, ice is moving, of course. Um, it flows like water down um, a river mm. just very, very slowly. Um, and, and there's some dramatic uh, radar images through the ice on Antarctica, which shows the ice flowing over mountains. And it flows and creates eddies just as a river would going down um, going down a stream or in fact uh, air when air goes over a mountain it does exactly the same it, it, it bounces on the other side and the ice does exactly the same mm. so the ice is moving all the time so mm. it's very very difficult to have any structures in Antarctica because they'll be destroyed uh, in a century two centuries very very mm. quickly as the ice flows over it fascinating okay i think somebody calculated uh, a little while ago i read that the bodies of uh, robert falcon scott edward wilson uh and uh birdie i can't remember his full name now but the three people that were found dead mm -hmm. coming back from the pole they calculated that their bodies would have been released into the ocean about two or three years ago which is quite an amazing yeah. thing to, to um, it, it's it's slow and steady it does that they had the um remains of a lancastrian um which was a civil airliner based on the lancaster bomber uh was lost in um in chile uh on the andes and it just disappeared a big mystery of course this aircraft just disappeared and it it came back 60 years later at the bottom of a glacier so it had spent 60 years inside the glacier uh, until it was disgorged at the bottom when the glacier was melting at the bottom of the glacier and suddenly all of these bits of aircraft started coming out of the glacier um so yeah that's how long it takes to flow down a glacier fascinating okay um, that's question, Bill. Yep. Just to quickly interrupt, I think I might just put on some more lights just to illuminate myself a little bit. If you don't mind, just 30 seconds. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Um, well, Ralph's gone. Thank, thanks, everyone, for your questions. Um, I think I've had double the amount that we had last time. So these shows are proving very popular. And the standard of questions have been absolutely superb. So thank you very much to everyone. Um, right, Okay. Oh, yes, you're very uh, illuminated now. Yes, that's a little bit better. I was sort of um, disappearing in the darkness. <laughs> there we go. Okay, brilliant. Right, next question, Ralph, has come in from a Mrs. Pauline Tallett, and she says, how likely is it that many of the young men coming over on boats to England at the moment are soldiers? Uh, well, uh, yes, we don't know. And that's the whole trouble with, with people just flooding into the country. Um, there was a rumor 20 more years ago um, from Mr. Tony Blair that we were getting the brightest and the best from around the world. But of course, that's simply not true. Um, and we have no way of knowing who these people are because they're undocumented and deliberately so they throw their documents away mm. and if you think about it it's highly unlikely we're, we're getting the brightest and the best because um the brightest and the best would have a good job in the country they come from and so why would you risk your life on a boat to come to another country mm. so it's highly likely that we're getting the criminals and the detritus that nobody else wants um, and that's the problem with undocumented immigration. Um, we, we had evidence of that from Romania uh, many years ago when Romania started joining the EU and the EU, the uh, Romanian president said, um, joining the EU has been wonderful. Crime has gone down by over 70%. Yeah, okay. And we know why. <laughs> So, yeah, um, it, this should be stopped straight away. Um, you can't have undocumented uh, immigration where we're just getting the detritus of, of the world. 
mm. because the brightest and the best are not going to risk their lives on a flimsy boat trying to get to another country. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it should be stopped. It's not good for them. It's not good for us. It's not good for the world. Yeah. And yet our politicians do not have um, the, the fortitude, the, um, the guts to actually do anything about it. They're, they're too influenced by um, focus groups, and so that's what they do. They, um, yeah, there's, there's, um, we could easily get lost on that subject and talk about oh, it. Oh, totally, for, yes. yeah, very long time. So we'll have to cut it short there, unfortunately. But um, there are some people, of course, that think that there may be a hidden agenda going on with um, this level of immigration. But who knows? Who knows? Mm. Okay, right, let's move on to ancient history now. And we've got a couple of questions here from a Mr. John Mitchell, who has asked, if the ancient Egyptians were basically Caucasian, does this clash with the Darwinian view that Europeans became white due to white skin being able to absorb more vitamin D from the sun? Yeah, tricky. Again, it's another contentious issue that people will not discuss because it uh, becomes too contentious. Uh, there's several ways of looking at that. I mean, the Darwinian idea of, you know, whiter skins the further north you go is is genuinely very good. Um, it makes sense. Um, but it's sort of contradicted by the pharaohs being ginger and white. Uh, again, this is contentious, but I mean, this comes from Professor Kalkaldi, who was the uh, forensic scientist, the chief forensic scientist in Paris, who studied the uh, mummy of Ramesses the Great when it was taken to Paris for preservation. And uh, his analysis showed that Ramesses the Great was uh, pale skinned and ginger. And that's exactly how he looks if you look at him. Um, so that the hair coloring is not from um mummification chemicals or anything of that nature it's pure ginger uh likewise if you go to the cairo museum uh if you look at yuya and thuyu who were the matriarch and the patriarch of the amana dynasty of um, akhenaten and nefertiti they are pure ginger you can see it and according to professor calcades um Kalkaldi, uh analysis this is pure this is real ginger Mm. Um, so the question is, how do these gingers get there? Um, have they gone to the north and then come back? As indeed some people say, some people are trying to uh, push the idea that the uh, Celts came back from the northern sort of latitudes and went down into Egypt and that Egypt was settled by Celts. Not entirely sure that's so myself, although it could be one solution to that uh, um, to what we see in the evidence before us um, if you want to go really esoteric and say that uh, the megalithic era was was designed and calculated to be a megalithic era by outside influence then they might have used certain phenotypes certain you know types of people from different areas and place them uh, in Egypt and various other places as a part of the megalithic building project, you might say. Um, we don't know. There's, there's too, much, um, too much to speculate on this. Um, but it's true that uh, the DNA analysis they've done so far, and remember this DNA, DNA analysis is not cast in stone because the genetics is very um, degraded, you might say. I mean, these are 3,000 year old mummies. A lot of the DNA is degraded and they can only get snippets of it. Um, and so it's not the best quality DNA you can possibly get. But it does show that there is a great um, similarity between the Amarna dynasty of Tutankhamun and a lot of people in Western Europe, that there is a genetic uh, similarity between the two. Mm. Not surprising if they're all ginger, of course. Mm. Um, but how that came about, 
Well, we don't know. Open to speculation. But I, I do run through this ginger monarchy. Um, I highlight it. People don't like me highlighting it. Again, there are taboo subjects in today's world that you are not allowed to talk about. Um, and one of those taboo subjects is uh, the phenotypes of uh, peoples. Mm. Um, but there is definite evidence for a ginger monarchy. Mm. You know, Adam was red. David was red. Uh, Ramesses II was red. Uh, by red, I mean ginger. So was Yuya. So was Thuyu. So was Cleopatra the Seventh. She was ginger. Um, evidence suggests that Jesus was ginger as well. I go through that in in my video. Um, what's my video called? It's called um, "Was Jesus Black?" It's on my video channel. Uh, and there is evidence that Jesus was ginger as well. And of course, when we look at the Hukuk mosaic. Um, which at the very least is the king of Edessa. It's the leader of the Jewish revolt. Uh, he is ginger. That's what the mosaic shows, and it's a very early mosaic. And of course, I say that that particular character was Jesus himself, and therefore Jesus was ginger, because that mosaic displays a ginger monarch yet again. Mm. Um, so there was a ginger monarchy, undeniably so. Mm. Um, how that fits in with, you know, migrations and, you know, settlement patterns. Well, we don't entirely know, but there mm. we go. It's an interesting subject that it's needs more work. Very much so. And it, it leads on very nicely to the next, uh, question stroke comment that I've got here from Craftomatic. Um, oh, yes. Yep. And, uh, Lisa has written, I think you can probably guess what my question will be because I've been making a push for Ralph to take his research on Queen Scota and ginger hair and expound on it in a mind's blown sort of way. I think the Mesoamerican and Polynesian connections in the videos I shared are very significant and worth exploring. I think there's something very important hidden in this ginger head mystery that needs to be unraveled. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ralph. Yeah, um, it's possibly something I need to look at more. I mean, more and more DNA evidence is coming out. So there is more evidence that we can use. Um, Egypt doesn't like this evidence. And so Zahi Hawass and, and his successors have rather stood upon any further analysis. And so I think even now the most recent analysis is about eight years ago or more. Mm, so we could have more data if that was allowed, but unfortunately it's not. But uh, yeah, I could actually go and do more research based on the DNA analysis. That might be interesting. Um, it might be worth pointing out that if you were if you were tracing the movements of peoples and you wanted to know how successful a particular people were and where they went to, it would be very simple just to give them blue eyes and ginger hair or something of that nature, you know, a particular phenotype marker. And then you can uh, analyze where these people have come from and gone to. Mm. Um, so it just happens to be coincidentally um convenient that these people have a particular phenotype and you can actually follow that phenotype mm. so yeah more research is required i must admit mm. thank you lisa uh, by the way i realized now that at the start of this video i said we'd start with current events and then i asked you a question on uh the perry reese map so uh <laughs> it's nearly current spot, spot the deliberate mistake people in, in uh, terms of um egypt it's it's current yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> brilliant thank you lisa for the question uh let's move on to uh a question from robert and i can't pronounce his surname uh properly i, I apologize for that x e r x e s so i'm not sure how you would pronounce that Zexies? Yes, possibly. Xerxes. Anyway, apologies, Robert. Um, he's asked, Ralph, have you done any research regarding megaliths in the Americas 
or anywhere else excluding the UK and Egypt. If these megaliths could be connected, it would indicate a global network of ancient civilization. Oh, they are undeniably, I think, connected. I haven't done a great deal of research because I've only um, been to Central America a couple of times. Um, lots of other people have done that. Uh, and so there's lots of data out, you know, about the various sites in South America. But are they connected? Well, we can't say for definite um, because it's so difficult to date stone and, and the people who actually built those um, uh, those megalithic sites. I think they are definitely linked. They were all doing the same thing with the same type of megaliths, the same sort of unbelievable uh, stonework and the same sort of unbelievable movement of those stones having cut them all at the same time i think it must have been um in various places around the world so yes we do have this worldwide megalithic cult and that's very difficult to explain in classical terms because there wasn't supposed to be you know regular communication between sites across the world and the things they were building were pretty much impossible anyway that's why a lot of people go down the esoteric route because it's very difficult to explain and just saying they did it and it happened is not a good explanation um, their explanations invariably uh, don't make sense uh, we have dating issues with uh, central america and south america the same as we do at balbec where they say balbec was roman when it's pretty obvious to anyone at Baalbek, this is in the Lebanon, that there were two building eras. You know, there was an earlier megalithic building era and then the Romans built on the top. Now, give the Romans their due, they were pretty megalithic themselves. They were still using lumps of uh, stone for the, um, uh, the Temple of Jupiter there, which were uh, around 70 tons. I mean, that's pretty big as a stone goes. Um, so the Romans were doing quite well, but they did have um, block and tackle. They did have iron. They did have horses, which rather helped. But the megalithic work underneath is is much, much bigger um, and much, much earlier. So, yeah, um, there was a worldwide megalithic era, and it's not been fully explained as yet. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Ralph, and thank you, Robert, for your question. Um, okay, next question, and I've got to read this one out. Bear with me one moment while I just locate it on my phone. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Here we are. So this comes in from Andrew Christie, and he has asked, has Ralph any perspective on how many different peoples migrated to Britain and from what regions? Some surnames suggest Egypt, i.e. Machet, Matt is goddess, Chet, offspring, or Alan, which is my mother's surname, funnily enough, and it's spelt the same way, which is an uncommon way of spelling it, A-L-L-A-N, which is Scythian and Haddon, Mes Mesopotamia, i.e. Asser Haddon. I went to school with people who held these surnames and they all had distinct physical characteristics. Sallow skin, high cheekbones and well-formed lips, match it. Blonde, blue eyes, fair skin, Alan. And jet black hair, thick set frame and milk white skin, had on. Tricky subject. Um... <clears throat> because it's so difficult to uh, track where people have come from just from phenotypes. But, I mean, rather than Egypt, uh, you know, someone called Alan, who happens to be blonde, uh, I would say more likely to come from the Alans. And the Alans were sort of Northern Germanic people uh, who were probably, uh, you know, like the Dutch, uh, tall, blonde, um, vaguely sort of Nordic looking, there were lots of blondes uh, came across with the Allens. Um, difficult with names. Uh, you've got to ensure that that is an old name. 
rather than, you know, so many names have been corrupted down the years, mm -hmm. um, that you're actually talking about a name that's specifically come from a region. But uh, yeah, of course, there's been lots of migrations into Britain because most of Britain was covered in ice, you know, up until um, 10,000, 11,000 years ago, especially during the uh, Younger Dryas, Britain was covered in ice. It was not really a habitable place. The ice sheet stopped uh, circa around Manchester region, between Manchester and uh, Birmingham. And the rest of the south of Britain would have been uh, pretty uninhabitable. It would have been very cold, inclement. Um, and there were many people on Doggerland, which is now the North Sea, mm. living on Doggerland. Um, all of those people, and, and from many other regions, would have migrated into Britain, which would have been free land, you know, when the ice disappeared. Um, so there would have been many mi migrations. And one of those migrations, I say, was of Queen's Gotha. And, uh, but that would have been 1300, uh, yeah, about 1300 BC, um, maybe up to 1000 BC, so much, much later. But that would have been a very small migration. You know, the, the, um, uh, the emigration of Queen Scota and King Gaethelos, uh, if it happens to be true, and, and, you know, the Scottish annals think it was true, if you read Scotty Chronicon, that would only have been about a thousand people. A very, very small migration in general terms. Um, but nevertheless, they can be very influential because uh, if they come across with superior technology, superior weaponry, um, then they can take over a nation. And uh, that's probably what they did. So there could have been some Egyptian influences come in um, from that emigration. And remember, the Amarna dynasty were ginger. It seems most likely that most of them were ginger because the patriarch and matriarch, uh, Yuya and Thuya, were both ginger. And so the people on that exodus that went to Ireland and Scotland would have been Egyptian gingers. And you have to ask yourself, did the Scottish ginger and the Irish ginger mm. come from these uh, Egyptian emigrants or did it come from Vikings in a later era? We don't know, of course. Mm. Um, perhaps a DNA analysis might give you better information on that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting that there, there were quite a few cultural flows back in the ancient eras. You know, people were coming and going quite a lot. Um, Did so and well. certain people were taking over various peoples. Um, yes. So it wouldn't have been just the Egyptians did that. The Spartans did exactly the same. Hmm. The Spartans came into uh, southern Greece and they took over the, um, the Helots hmm. and became the controlling authority for the Helots uh, for hundreds of years, for centuries. Hmm. And it's possible that the Spartans were again linked to these emigrations out of um, uh, out of uh, Egypt, because uh, I think it's in the book of Maccabees, the Maccabees say that the Israelites and the Spartans were cousins. Um, so even in those times, they were saying there were cultural links between the, the Spartans and the Israelites. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't the, the BBC a little while ago suggest that the people that possibly built Stonehenge were very dark skinned? <laughs> they, yes. <laughs> well, they have their politically correct hat always firmly affixed. Mm -hmm. um, that they said Cleopatra was was black. Mm. Um, yeah, come on, BBC, stop giving us misinformation. We have images of Cleopatra from, um, from the time, the earliest portrait of her. She has ginger hair, doesn't she? Yeah, she's got ginger hair. Mm. But these portraits are very early. They came from. Um, um, Her Her Heraclion. Um, anyway, next to Pompeii. So they were part of the Pompeii uh, eruption. So those images come from 76, I think it is, or 78 AD, when the uh, volcano exploded and Pompeii was covered in ash. 
So they're very early images, and they show Cleopatra as being ginger, mm. very pale skinned and ginger. And yet the BBC has this image saying she's black. And then they did one saying that Jesus was black. And you go, oh, come on, talk about misinformation. And mm. the trouble is, this misinformation doesn't help matters, it's not helping cultural cohesion at all. It's just inflaming um, competition, you might say, between various various peoples. Um, quite clearly, Cleopatra was ginger, Jesus was probably ginger, and the people in Stonehenge, unlikely, unlikely that they would be dark-skinned. They might be Middle Eastern, but Middle Easterners are not dark-skinned. Mm. Um, and a lot of them are ginger as well. I mean, the classic example is is Muhammad al Yukubi, mm. um, who is the great, 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 thirty or forty greats grandson of Muhammad. Um, he's supposed to be a direct descendant of uh, Muhammad, um, but Muhammad al Yukubi is is ginger. He looks like a Scotsman. <laughs> yeah, a Scotsman yeah. on holiday in the Near East with a with a nice suntan, you know. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, it's, it's rather it's it's very typical of uh, well, it's a Marxist ploy, isn't it? Basically, to kind of uh, murky the waters of our, our history. Yeah, they've been doing this for quite some time. It, mm. it it is one of their ploys: divide and conquer. They try to do it with class warfare. That didn't work because, you know, the, the working man was too wealthy in most of Europe to worry about class warfare. And, and now they've tried cultural warfare instead, mm. setting the cultures against each other. Mm. It's very, very divisive. And the BBC really should be closed down for, for its meddling in, in culture. I've, yeah. I've not watched the BBC now for more than 10 years. I, I just mm. refuse to. Mm. Same here. Um, next question from Michael Woods McCausland, who was asked, what is Ralph's take on the Frisian Aurea Linda book? Oh, I, I don't know that one. Is that the one with all the crazy pictures inside it? I haven't even heard of it. I, I right. Apologize, Michael, okay. I'll, I'll look into that. Yeah, that there is a, a book out there, and I can't remember its name, which had all of these very fanciful um peculiar pictures inside it and was supposed to be from the medieval era um but quite clearly having looked through it it had nothing of real interest in it so i concluded it was a fake if that's what they're talking about right. um it was something like a a 19th century fake there were quite a few of these in the 19th century where they were trying to um, invent history and i think that was probably one of them Mm. if okay. i've got the right book okay uh next question comes from michael glemdall um thank you michael and he says how do you think underground cities like deren kuyu and came mackley uh, are how do you think underground cities how old sorry how old do you think underground cities like deren kuyu and came malaki are in what historical context do you suppose these cities were built? Uh, I presume that's talking about Cappadocia uh, over in um, eastern Anatolia. I don't know those particular names. He should have um, um, highlighted the, the location more, more clearly. I presume that's Cappadocia, uh, where there's quite a few underground cities um, mm. over in that region. Modern day Most, in, in Yeah, eastern Anatolia, yeah. Um, and most of them are relatively sort of recent, although they might have had more ancient origins. But there's not much evidence for those ancient origins. But I would imagine people have, have been carving holes in those particular rocks for ages because they're, they're quite soft and they're, they're quite easy to mine. And what they used to use them for, I think I've got a, a rather different take on this because if you go to Cappadocia, they'll say these were underground cities, and I'm looking at these cities going, no, <laughs> that's, that's not an underground city at all. Um, it's a necropolis, and I think most of these underground places were necropolises, 
um, cities of the dead, not cities of the living. So you go to Cappadocia and the main sites there, we, we toured them just um, uh, two months ago. And um, so you have three big caverns. I say big, they're not, not actually that big, but anyway, three caverns next door to each other. And you've got a, um, um, a chapel. They say it's a church, but it's not a church. It's not big enough for a church. Um, it's big enough for one family. So it's not a cathedral. It's not a church. It's big enough for one family. That gives you a clue. Then you have a room for the dead. So you've got lots of areas um, with, you know, tombs laid out that you can actually lay out the dead. And then next door to that, you've got a feasting hall for the Last Supper. Because that was the tradition. So it, it seems quite obvious to me that you come to these places. This is how they got their wealth, because people used to spend an awful lot of money on burying the dead. It was very important. Um, they didn't spend money on their own houses and things of that nature, but they spent money on temples, mm, palaces maybe for the kings, and burying the dead. And so you bring your dead to this place in Cappadocia. You go to the chapel where you have a service, the same as you do now for burying the dead. You know, uh, I, I don't know how this is done around the rest of the world, but in Britain, quite often, if you go to a cemetery, there will be a small chapel in the center of the cemetery. So you go to the small chapel, just big enough for the family and a few friends. You have the service to say goodbye to the dead. You then put the dead into the uh, uh, chamber next door, which has all of the tombs for the for the dead. Um, you lay them out, and then you go next door again to the feasting hall for the Last Supper, where you have a grand wake, which mm. is not so much a tradition in Britain anymore, but certainly in Ireland and places like that, you have a wake. You have a big festival mm. to say goodbye to the dearly departed. And those three are right next door to each other in, in on successive occasions in Cappadocia. So quite obviously, this was a, um, a necropolis. Mm. And um, they used to do this all over that region. So if you go to Haran, which is just below Edessa, uh, in northern Syria, it's now in, in Anatolia, but it used to be in Syria. Um, there necropolis for the common people was quite large and again it was all full of tunnels that they drilled down into this uh, sort of limestone come sandstone uh, cliffs and so on to the east of Haran because burying the dead was very important mm. so yeah and all of those were well Haran of course was 2,000 years old Cappadocia was uh, mostly Christian, as you could see it now, so they would have to be less than 2,000 years old. But I'm sure they were based upon um, earlier examples that had just been Christianized in later eras. Mm. Um, so you probably find Cappadocia has been used as a burial ground for, you know, 10,000 years or something. Who knows? <clears throat> I also and had that, just very quickly to end, I also had the same idea for... Um, Gebekli Tepe. I think we talked about this before, didn't we? Um, if not, maybe we can talk about it later. But I think Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe and all of the other tepes are all necropolises. I, I think that these were not temple areas. They were not cities. People are starting to say that Gebekli Tepe is a city because they found all of these rooms behind the, the main temple area. I don't think they're rooms for the living. I think they're rooms for the dead. Um, for you know various reasons, uh, there didn't seem to be any doorways, uh, proper doorways. They didn't seem to be linked together like you would for a housing estate. Um, and each of the rooms had a small T pillar inside it, making them sacred rooms, not necessarily profane livable rooms. Mm -hmm. I think they were rooms for housing the dead and therefore 
Gebekli Tepe is a huge, great uh, necropolis, exactly the same. Very interesting take. Thanks for that, Ralph. Mm. I think I remember reading somewhere that um, one of those necropolises was discovered by a bloke who was doing some decorating and knocked through a wall in his kitchen and discovered <laughs> this. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't so, mind doing. I wouldn't mind doing the decorating every so often if that sort of thing happened. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, thanks. So, next question. Uh, this is from VP, I believe VP, and they have said. What do you think of Felice Vinci's theory of the Baltic origins of Homeric poems? According oh. to Vinci, Homeric poems originated from where the people migrated to south at the end of the Bronze Age, bringing the stories with them. Um, yeah, so your thoughts on that, Ralph? I've not heard of that idea. Um I can't say I agree with it because too much within the Homeric uh, um, mythologies equates to Greece and the Mediterranean and the Black Sea um, and not the Baltic. So I can't see how those stories and tales would be linked up to the Baltic region. Um, uh, things like the clashing rocks and so on um it's quite obviously the bosphorus uh things like the um the the thalos and so on and the floating islands of the mediterranean are to do with santorini um and you know there's so much and and the golden fleece ends up in in georgia um on the black sea and, and things of that nature there's too much of it is linked already with the aegean and you would have to find an awful lot of evidence uh of this being from the baltic to to generate any interest in that theory i can't see it matching with the baltics at all really okay thanks um right Oh, he's actually asked one more question here, mm. which is one can find mushrooms represented in religious images and in clothing of religious leaders. How are mushrooms related to the church and biblical history? Well, people have written about that previously. I don't write about it. I don't know enough um, uh, about fungi and their usage as narcotics and whatever. Didn't, um, um, sorry, Ralph, didn't John Allegro? Allegro was, did, yeah. Yeah, he wrote a, a whole book on it, I think. Yeah, he he, he said uh, that Jesus was a mushroom. Um, what was it called? Jesus and the Sacred Mushroom or something, his book, yeah, by Allegro. Probably worth reading. I don't think it's correct. Um, I mean, he used to be a respected and recognized historian. But he was rather pushed out after he wrote that Jesus was a mushroom. And uh, he sort of lost his position. <laughs> it was the end of his career, almost, that book. You have to be careful sometimes about what you write. Um, but yes, he was saying that uh, the Jesus cult, uh, Christianity, was the cult of a narcotic uh, mushroom. And that they were just all high, basically. Possibly um, the most left-field theory. <laughs> yeah, it was... <laughs> Somewhat left foot, but this is the trouble when you cannot find these characters in the historical record. This was the whole trouble with the um, uh, the, the mythology um, of Christianity. And so we have these people that believe that is it is all mythical simply because nobody has found the real characters in the historical record. That is what I've been trying to address in my books because I undermine all of this mythicism completely because I've found the people in the historical record. So it no longer has to be mythical. It no longer has to be a mushroom. Um, although I dare, having said that, I dare say that some people used narcotics uh, in that early era. I mean, there's, there's quite a few images of um, cannabis leaves and so on uh in early artwork mm. um someone did a whole book on tracing cannabis leaves in in uh, mosaics and so on mm. so uh yeah there was use of 
various narcotics, I'm sure. It's an interesting thing to consider, isn't it? I mean, mushrooms have been around for a, a very, very long time. Could the church, uh, the Nazarene Church of Jesus and James, had initiation ceremonies that involved mushrooms? Who knows? Who knows? I, I, I'm sure. You see, it's something we've lost touch with. We, in our modern era in the West, we don't really know much about mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms are button mushrooms that you buy from the supermarket. That is a mushroom. And we have no idea really about the rest of the, the genus of, of mushrooms, of fungi. But when I was in Russia, people went to the forests still. It was a national thing. And so I was taken into the forest and they were pointing out dozens and dozens of different types of mushroom and mm. saying which ones you can eat, which ones were poisonous, which ones um, gave you a bit of a high. And they could identify them all because they did this every year. It was a cultural thing. Mm. And I'm sure people in the um, in the past did exactly this. They would have had people mm. out in the forests all the time. And it's not just the Russians, because I managed to forage about four beefsteak mushrooms from my local woods this year. So, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. So. Well, I, I do, but I'm not that good at this. I know my you know my five different types of mushroom is all i know yeah. um and anything else i steer away from because i've got no idea if they're good or bad but My, these yeah. uh these russians were going up to rush uh, to to mushrooms which look the most deadliest thing on the planet and they go oh that's that's really good that one <laughs> <laughs> oh is it it does yeah. it doesn't look good <laughs> yes. Making a mistake on that front could be the last mistake. Yeah, you ever it would make. be the last mistake you yes. make. Yeah. yeah. Be very careful, people, when it comes to mushrooms. Yeah, very careful indeed. Very careful. Right. Okay. Next question. Uh, let me just make sure this. Oh, no, that's. Uh... Oh, right. Okay. I think that's all the ancient questions covered now. Um, so we can move on to uh, biblical history. And the first question on that front. Um, yeah, there's, there's actually there's three questions here, one of which involves mushrooms. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they're looking at me, the host on this channel, and thinking, "Oh, we'll ask him about mushrooms." <laughs> um, anyway, right. So, uh, the first question from Old Man Junkins, um, and he asks, "What are Ralph's beliefs?" He says he is an atheist, but is also a Freemason, where one has to believe in God. With a lot of respect, are you not contradicting yourself in some way? No, um, I'm not. I am uh, an atheist, or I like to call myself a Gnostic atheist. Uh, the difference being that uh, an atheist um, or an agnostic doesn't know, whereas a Gnostic knows. Yeah. Gnosticism just means knowledge. So I, I I have the knowledge of atheism. It's not just a um, an unthinking conviction. It's based on knowledge. So I like to call myself a Gnostic atheist. Um, and when you join uh, Freemasonry, you don't have to believe in God as such. It depends on the uh, lodge you go to. But the question asked is, do you... Um, do you believe in a superior being? That's not quite the same question. Mm -hmm. And this has been used within masonry in many lodges um, uh, around the world, especially in Australia. So we're talking um, about the grand because, architect of the universe, yeah? Yeah, the great architect of the universe. But what is the great architect? What is a superior being? Any alien on a different planet would be a that had the technology to actually come and visit would be a superior uh, alien being or species. So the vast majority of atheist um, scientists, because most scientists believe that there is life elsewhere in the universe, could be considered to be religious as such because they believe in a superior being elsewhere in the universe and that is a definition of a god effectively uh, the thing is with god who defines how powerful the god is 
is is God omnipotent or not? If um, in fact the evidence suggests that God cannot be an omnipotent, either either God is not um, uh, what's the other word um, omnipresent, Isn't, yeah, yeah, or he's he or she is not omnipotent because there there is too much death and destruction in this world for a good god to be present at all times and be all powerful because an all powerful ever present god would not allow all of those disasters to happen i mean even things like you know tsunamis and volcanoes of course but even things like diseases things like mosquitoes would, I mean, would, what, um, sorry, Ralph, would a Christian argue that God gave us all free will? Would, would that be some sort of counter argument? Yeah, but if, if a, a good omnipresent God knows that there is a tidal wave coming across the uh, Pacific or, or knows that a volcano is about to blow its top uh, and they are all powerful and omnipresent, why did they not stop the disaster? Uh, that's not free will. That's allowing Mother Nature to destroy humanity uh, gratuitously. It's almost as bad as a little kid with a stick poking into an ant nest to see the ants scurry around and try and repair their ant nest. Um, that's just evil. If you have the power to stop it. I mean, if, if you have the power to stop a car crash and you didn't, does that make you good or make you evil? I think it would make you evil. So the evidence we have around us is either God is not um, omnipotent, all-powerful, or it is not omnipresent here all the time. So either God is is not powerful and cannot stop things, you know, natural events from happening. Or God has gone away and is not coming back for the next 20,000 years. It's got to be one or the other. Or I suppose the other argument is that God is evil and doesn't really care about the fate of humanity. That, you know, diseases are striking us left, right and center. That there are natural disasters day after day on this planet. And the God figure just doesn't care. Um. And of course, if the God is not all powerful and not omnipresent, then the God figure is exactly the same as an alien on a different planet. So if there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, that effectively is the God that we know. And so when you go to um, uh, a lodge, you can quite happily say, do you believe in... Um, I think they actually say an all-powerful being, but, you know, let's skip over the all-powerful bit and just say a powerful being elsewhere in the universe. Yes, of course. 95% of uh, scientists do believe that, mm. including myself. And uh, therefore, of course, you can join Lodge. And there are several Lodges, especially in Australia, who actually have that as the basis of, of their... Um, one can't call it theology, but anyway, their uh, belief sort of system that um, God was an astronaut, effectively. Mm. Um, 2001, we discussed this before. Um, the 2001 film was based on that premise in mm. exactly the same fashion. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Fascinating subject. Thank you, Ralph. Bye. Right. Uh, so fascinating. I've lost my place. Hold on one minute. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, ah, here we are. Right. Uh, yeah, so question two from Old Man Junkins. If Jesus was a Mason, how powerful of a Mason was he in that context? What are the powers of Kabbalah and Masonry unified mixed with the Ben Ben Stone? Oh, I don't know the relationship between them and the Ben Ben Stone, between the Kabbalah and the Ben Ben. That would be interesting. Someone who knows more about the Kabbalah than I do. Um, <clears throat> as a king, and remember, I've indicated and proved that Jesus was a real king. He was a king of Edessa. Um, if he was a Freemason, and it seems likely that he was, he would have been the Grand Master. Masonry has always cultivated the monarch as being you know, the Grand Master or, or at least a, a very senior person within Lodge. 
just the same as the queen's cousin um was was the grand master of grand lodge has been for a long time um i can't remember his name for it just for a oh, minute the duke of kent yeah duke of kent yeah the guy guy who looks like um looks like the romanovs mm. because they were all related of course they were all cousins of each other all of these <laughs> royal families around europe in fact i believe he was asked um about 20 years ago or so um in the 90s when russia fell apart he was actually asked if he wanted to become king of russia i didn't know that because he was the closest relative to the Romanovs and he speaks fluent Russian and he looks like a Romanov. Anyway, he was the, um, <laughs> he was uh, very high up in masonry. And of course, Jesus as a king of Odessa would have been very high up. And that's why he was known as a tecton. And of course, tecton doesn't mean carpenter. It means a mason. And in this case, it means a speculative mason, a Freemason. Um, although some of them might have been operative masons as well, because a lot of these people were responsible for the great building projects like, you know, the Temple of Solomon, like the pyramids, things of that nature. So they were intimately linked between the two. Mm. Um, so, yeah, he would have been a very powerful uh, Freemason. Great. OK, uh, final question. <laughs> Finally, what levels of psychedelic experiences has Ralph had and <laughs> as he made reference of mushrooms stroke anointing in esoteric Judaism esoteric Christianity um never I've it's strange within our family we've never had any tendency to take anything um apart from alcohol and even my father didn't even do that he was pretty much teetotal um no we've some families seem to have it within the family that they are reckless with narcotics, whereas our family has always been um, virtually always stone cold sober. Mm. I think even when I was in college, <clears throat> the closest we used to get to this was um, some people used to smoke herbal cigarettes. <laughs> and that used to send some people crazy because everyone thought <clears throat> people were on um, smoking narcotics, but it was just herbal it was herbal tobacco. It was uh, it was mm. made of lavender and various other herbs. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've never had a drug in my life. So yeah, I don't partake. Well done, uh, Ralph. Great. Right. Well done. <laughs> um, thank you, old man Junkins, for those questions, and thank you, old man Junkins, for asking the final question to Ralph and not me. Because uh, anyway, no comment there. Right. Okay. Um, so next question comes in from. I can never say this name, Uncleanbient, I think is how you pronounce it. And they have asked, the only Jewish king whose death by crucifixion was recorded by the Romans was that of King Antagonos II, Matatias mm. in 37 BCE. Do you think that the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, a Jewish king, was based in any way on this earlier crucifixion? Well, it's not the only one that was recorded because we have a second one that was recorded um, by Josephus Flavius. And that was the leaders of the Jewish revolt. And uh, quite clearly, I mean, he says this in his um, Vita, his life. Uh, he records the crucifixion of the leaders of the Jewish revolt. Now the problem comes down to who do you think were the leaders of the Jewish revolt? And quite clearly, um, from the rest of Josephus's works, he says that the leaders um, were um, Monobazus. Monobazus and Kennedius of the Adiabene. Um, and the revolt didn't finish until they were captured by Titus at the end of the Jewish revolt. Um, and then the question is, who were Monobazus and Kennedius? They were of the Adiabeni royal family, so they were princes or perhaps a king. Um, but the, Ad the queen of Adiabeni was Queen Helena, and she was married to the king of Edessa. 
she was married to King Abgarus of Edessa. So it's pretty obvious that this Adiabeni royal family were the Edessan royal family. <clears throat> and uh, Josephus says that they were crucified um, after the Jewish revolt, that three leaders of the revolt were being crucified until he asked for them to be taken down. And they were taken down, two of them died, and one of them survived. It's obviously the um, crucifixion story of Jesus is exactly the same. Even the person who takes them down from the cross pretty much is the same person. One is called Joseph of Arimathea, and the other is called Josephus bar Matthias. Same person. Um, so here is another king who got crucified. Um, so Antogonos is not the only person um, who's recorded as being crucified. The leaders of the revolt were. But one of them survived. So we have another similarity with the gospel story. Two of them died, one of them survived. So one of the only people, I think, probably, ever recorded to have survived a crucifixion. Mm. That didn't happen very often. And it only happened, of course, because Josephus Flavius took them down early from the cross, which is what it says within the gospel story as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, here we have another royal personage who was uh, crucified. And I think this is the character that the uh, gospels was based upon. Um, some people out there say that... Um, the Adiabeni Edessans were allies of the Romans. And this needs addressing because, the, you know, these people keep saying this time and time again. And you think, you know, what planet are they on? Um, Josephus Flavius says that these people were captured after the Jewish revolt, that they surrendered to the Romans. Um, that... Titus, who was the commander at the time, who, who took the, the, the surrender, showed them leniency and then sent them to prison in Rome. So they were clapped in irons and sent to Rome as prisoners of Rome. And these are the very people who had destroyed the uh, Legion of Cestius back in um, AD 66, which started the uh, Jewish revolt. So they started the Jewish revolt by destroying a, uh, a Roman legion, completely almost. They then surrender to Titus. Um, he doesn't kill them, but sends them to prison in Rome. And there are some people who say, oh, therefore, they were allies of Rome. And you think, hold on a minute. What sort of allies you know, are, are, are they talking about? This is an ally who destroyed an army of the Romans and then was captured, put into chains and sent to prison in Rome in chains. These people were not allies. Mm. They were enemies of Rome. But on occasions, it does prove valuable to show leniency with the leaders of a particular revolt or a particular war. Um, it's not always the best policy to kill people. Uh, it's exactly what Britain did to um, Napoleon Bonaparte. Mm. We didn't kill him. We sent him into exile uh, on Elba. He escaped, didn't he, as well? He escaped. It was a bit of a silly thing to do, really. It wasn't quite far enough away. Um, so, and, and he had too many allies in that region, of course, Elba yes. in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, so he escaped and started a second war. But even following that second war, when he was defeated at uh, Waterloo, um, we still didn't kill him. Again, he was taken into, into prison and he was sent into exile on St. Helena. Interesting name, but there we go. Mm -hmm. um, St. Helena is an island down in, in the Atlantic. And because Britain controlled the the seas at that time, uh, there was no escape from St. Helena. But the, the, the thing to remember is he wasn't killed. He was shown leniency 
in exactly the same fashion as the Edessan monarchy were shown leniency, even having started a revolt against Rome. Um, and he was just sent into exile instead. Why? Well, because we didn't want to upset the French. You've got to remember that these people are charismatic leaders. Mm. They have numerous followers, millions of followers in a country you've just defeated. Do you want to antagonize all of those followers by killing their supreme leader, their spiritual it's leader? You make him a martyr, don't you? Yeah, make him a martyr. No, yeah. sometimes it's better just to send the guy into exile um, because otherwise, to do otherwise would to up, be to upset the locals and maybe cause another revolt, which is exactly what you don't want to do. Um, and that's exactly what the Romans, the Romans were canny enough to know how to deal with um, uh, dissenting voices and, and revolts within the empire. They'd had enough experience of doing this. And they didn't want another revolt like the Iceni revolt, which is, you know, um, was caused by um, being too harsh with the locals when the Iceni revolted against Rome and they destroyed about five or six cities. That was caused by a lack of leniency. They deliberately embarrassed the, the, the monarchs. Um, I think um, Boudicca was killed, wasn't she? And then her, her her daughters were raped or something, if I remember correctly. Anyway, they were, the situation was handled very uh, badly. Um, and um, it started a revolt, basically. We had the Iceni mm. revolt. I'll have to look up the details of that. It's a, a while since I've looked up the causes of the Iceni revolt. Um, but yeah, so no, the Edessans were not allies of Rome. To say so is is one of the most absurd things I've ever heard in my life. They were enemies. They were sworn enemies. It was the Edessans who caused the Jewish revolt. Um, but at the end of the revolt, all wars, pretty much, and all revolts have to end with a political so, uh, solution. Very rarely does a, does a war come to an end where there is a complete capitulation. Um, the very rare ones would be the end of World War II, for instance, where there was a complete and utter capitulation. Most other wars always come to a political conclusion, and therefore you have to come to a political agreement with the people who started that particular revolt. And that's been the way of the world for thousands of years. Mm. And uh, that was, you know, what happened in this occasion. Mm. Thanks. Um, so just uh, going back to um, Josephus there, um, he mentions Monobazus and Kennedyus. <clears throat> so we, we are identifying Monobazus with Izartes, yep. Izas Manu. Who was Kennedyus? We don't know. Um, that's an interesting one because he only appears like once in mm. the works of Josephus and we get this guy called Kennedy. Um, and we don't really know who he is, um, where he fits into the uh, Edessan monarchy, where he fits into the gospel story or anything of that nature. Um, would, it, would it be a safe bet to assume that he could have been one of uh, Jesus's brothers? Yes, I would say so. But it's not obvious who he would have been. Mm. The trouble being that they use pseudonyms and nicknames so often that people ended up with multiple names. Again, some people don't like these multiple names, but it's true that they had them. Um, you've only got to look up uh, Adam Clark um, in his analysis of the... Adam Clark is a venerable old theologian I use quite a lot. And he says that Judas was called Judas, Thomas, Didymus, Labaius, Thaddeus, Adai. So he had six names. That was just one of the brothers of Jesus. That was the twin brother of Jesus, mm -hmm. because Thomas Didymus means the twin twin. Um, and so that's been known, you know, uh, for hundreds of years. Well, um, Adam Clark was writing in the in the late 19th century. Um, 
so these people have multiple names and mm. sometimes these names are just different translations in different languages so thomas and didymus are the same name in two languages mm. thaddeus and, and uh Lebeus are the same name in two different languages mm. so you can see how the names sort of multiply but mm. still not found Kennedyus. That is a bit of a mystery. If mm. anyone wants to look up Kennedyus and give some suggestions, yeah, we should look into this more because mm. I'm sure we should be able to find him somewhere in the gospel story. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you. And apologies to Jacob if you're watching about the multiple names, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this... Was I talking about Jacob? I suppose it could have been. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, one can't help but think of Jacob when we're talking about multiple names of uh, kings and queens, etc. So he doesn't believe in them. There we are. No, he doesn't. No. No. <clears throat> how many? How many multiple names does uh, uh, the Queen of England? How many did she have? Oh, well, in titles, she has about fifty different titles. Yeah. So if you class those uh, titles as being names, because many of the names that the um, the monarchies had and the gospel stories had, many of those are not names; they're titles. Mm. You know, the, the, the title of Peter, which we all use for that disciple, is not a name. That's just, it's a title. His name was Simon. Mm. Monobasis is the only king, isn't it? Yeah, Monobasis is Christ the only Christ. king. Again, it's, it's, it's a title, which has been applied to many uh, monarchs. In fact, even Jesus was called the only king. Mm. Um, somewhere in the epistles, I think he's called the only king. Mm. Um, so yeah, again, it's another common title that was used by several, you know, generations. Mm. Okay. Next question comes in from Lisa Miller and Lisa was asked, please ask Ralph about Joseph, uh, the biblical stepfather to Jesus from the perspective of his own research. Yes. Uh, Joseph again, is one of these that we can't d definitively find within the um, the story of the uh, Edessan monarchy. So uh, we have this stepfather or possibly father. Of course, they call him a stepfather because they don't, they want Mary to be a virgin. So he has to be a stepfather. But, you know, um, that means that Mary was an old, uh, an adulteress she was having sex with god instead of her husband mm. um which is not my joke this comes from the talmud the talmud <laughs> the talmud says this that she was um playing the prostitute with carpenters <laughs> <laughs> um yes uh that comes from the talmud so uh yes this dichotomy has been known for quite some time but of course the it's not really a dichotomy. All of the um, Egyptian pharaohs were the son of God. But that didn't mean within Egyptian terms that they didn't have a father. It was known that they had a natural father, yet they were still spiritually the sons of a particular God or another. So, you know, mm. Ramesses is, the, you know, the son of Ra. Armos is, is the son of the moon, moon God and so on. I mean, it's just a... A standard Egyptian title that all of the pharaohs had. Um, who was Joseph? We don't entirely know. Um, the natural father of Jesus would have been King Abgarus of Edessa. Um, in in my works, you know, from my Jesus King of Edessa book. Um, but these royal families had convoluted genealogies quite often. Um, there might have been possibly a stepfather. There might have been a stepmother um, because uh, there is a slight problem with the chronology for the, for the character of Mary. Um, so Jesus and his brothers might have had two mothers, it's possible, mm. um, for various gene genealogical problems. But um, no, we, we cannot find the name Joseph in the historical record. And um, so that is, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it's something that needs further research. How do we link in Joseph <clears throat> and the name Joseph to the Edessan 
royal family. The rest of it fits in very nicely. Mm. But Joseph does not. Is that just a, a name plucked out of um, mm. thin air for the story? I don't know. Mm. Uh, I've often wondered about the three wise men, Ralph, because there's Mary for her entire pregnancy trying to convince Joseph that she's a virgin and she's carrying God's child. And then these three blokes turn up bearing gifts, very expensive gifts. So I don't, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yes, um, you, you know, would, would stoke some jealousy, one would have thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, especially coming all the way out of Parthia, just, just to <laughs> yeah. give some gifts. Um, okay, next question. Comes from Peter Rabbit. And Peter has asked, what are Ralph's findings regarding Jesus's siblings? And was his ministry primarily a family affair? Was Jesus married to Martha and Mary? And who was the beloved disciple? Ah, lots of questions all in one there. Yeah, so, sorry. yeah, yeah basically, yeah. back to sorry. the family of the Odessan monarchs, who, who were the brothers and siblings and was it a, a primarily a, a ministry a family ministry if you like yeah well from the gospel story the brothers of jesus were james jude joseph and, and simon and it just so happens that all of those names are names of disciples of jesus so it seems very likely that it was a family affair and i said this back in the mid 90s when i was writing my um, uh, jesus last of the pharaohs book it seems so obvious that this was a family affair um and they were all there supposedly at his crucifixion and so on as well you know um and this is how royal families operate they keep power within the family because that's how you maintain your power. This idea of um, democracy, where you give up power to a complete stranger every five years, did not exist in that era. You can you you gain power for your family and you consolidate power for your family, and you do that by involving your offspring. Uh, in various parts of the administration. So they become your disciples. The only people who didn't do this were the um, uh, the Ottoman Muslims who didn't trust any of their brothers and sisters. And so when they gained power, they killed them all. <laughs> <laughs> and instead they had the, the, the Janissaries, I think they called them, where they got Christians because they didn't even trust fellow Muslims. So they got Christians from the Balkan states, uh, quite often castrated um, Christians, and put them into power as being the administrators. So, you know, all of the, you know, you couldn't call them aristocracy, but all of the administrators um, of the monarchy were strangers who had been brought in, brought in from the uh, Balkans. But in the case of um, this particular family, I think they were concentrating power within the family, a bit like the Egyptians used to be uh, doing, and therefore putting sons and daughters into positions of power within the administration. And so, yes, the disciples would have all been brothers uh, of Jesus. And yes, he would have been married to Mary and Martha um, because... Um, so he was married to two of his sisters. Yeah, this is this comes from the Talmud. And I, I don't know why it's not being highlighted uh, much before. I'm just going to look something up. Um, what do we want to look? We want sister and uh, wife. Um, this comes from the Talmud because the uh, Talmud says, that the high priest of Jerusalem should have a, a wife and a second wife um, as a backup to the first wife, basically. Um, and so if Jesus became high priest of Jerusalem, which is sort of indicated because uh, the Talmud says that Jesus of Gamala and I identify Jesus of Gamala with the biblical Jesus and with the Odessans. 
um, became high priest. He became a high priest in AD 60, I don't know, 62, 64, something of that nature. Um, and if he became high priest, then he should have had two wives, according to the Talmud. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, he would have married the Bethany sisters, Mary and Martha. Uh, and we also have uh, Corinthians 9.5, where Saul is complaining because he cannot have a sister wife. And uh, he says, um, have we not the power to lead about a sister wife as the same as the other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas do? Cephas is Peter. Different names again. Sorry, chaps. Uh, people okay. do have different names. Peter is called Cephas. But there we go. So here is Saul saying, I want a sister wife because the brothers of the Lord the brothers of Jesus and Peter, they all have sister wives. So why can't I have one? <laughs> um, and this is very badly translated. So if you look in this, uh, say in the King James version, uh, it'll say a sister and a wife. Um, because it's, it's rather contentious. They don't want to admit that Jesus was married um, to a sister wife. Um, but if you read, not all Bibles are the same. So sometimes you have to select your Bibles. And the ones I like are the, um, the Rotherham and the Derby. Now, both of those are literal Bibles. And they were specifically written because of the problem of interpretation. So these texts are being translated and interpreted by religious scholars and of course they will apply their biases mm. to their interpretation to their translation from the greek and so the rotherham and the derby set out to have a literal translation not having any interpretation whatsoever even if it didn't really make sense um, they would still give a literal translation and so um, let's have a look at the What it says, if we go to the Rotherham, um, the Rotherham says, have we not the right to take around a sister wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Cephas is Peter, of course. Um, and let's have a look at the Derby. I've got 16 Bibles here, so he's... he's got to wander through them. Here's the Derby. Um, it says, have we not a right to take around a sister as a wife? That's even a different translation. <laughs> have we not the right to take around a sister as a wife, as also the other apostles and the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? So the disciples, most of the disciples, uh, married their sisters, mm. as did Peter. Um, why? Well, because that was common. Uh, it was a way of keeping the money within the family. So, um, so sorry, Ralph, were all the, every single one of the 12 disciples, were they aristocracy, all 12? Oh, the majority, I would say. Um, Organizations like this often have a lot of aristocracy. Sometimes you need uh, lower class people in because they have particular skills. So you might take in a particular person um, because they were a, a very charismatic and effective fighter, perhaps. Mm. You know, the sort of Lancelot-like uh, character mm. who you bring in not because of their uh, family and their arist aristocracy, uh, but you bring them in because they are, you know, the best knight in the land or something. Or you might do that with the the best scientist or something of that nature. You might bring those people into your uh, mm. into your organization as well. Mm. But the majority, I think, would have been family. Mm. Okay. And they married their sisters because that's what the pharaohs used to do. You know, Akhenaten married three of his daughters. 
Queen Cleopatra married both of her brothers. Um, it was just a common thing. Um, Agrippa II, who was the king of Judea, he married his sister. Well, he didn't entirely marry her, but they lived together as husband and wife. So uh, Agrippa and Berenike were an mm -hmm. item. They were brother and sister. So, th th I mean, this was fairly common in this era. Mm. And uh, the last question was, who was the beloved disciple? Oh, yes. Did, uh, yeah, we don't know. Um, the favorites are Lazarus, because Lazarus was known as a beloved sort of disciple. And I, at one point, said that Lazarus might be Judas. But they were just using a different name for Judas at that time, Judas being the brother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and he might have been the beloved disciple because he's mentioned as being beloved. Mm -hmm. um, but the alternative, which could be true, is that the beloved disciple was Mary Magdalene. Because she was a very beloved uh, disciple. Um, this is the disciple that Jesus used to kiss quite often. And the disciple who Jesus married at the wedding at Cana. The, the only trouble with that identification is that the, the beloved disciple is always um, has a, um, a pronoun of he. But, if, you know, if they were writing and rewriting this story, they might have had to have put he instead of she. Mm. So I think those are the two options here. The, the two options, either um, the disciple is, is Judas Lazarus, if they are the same person, mm. or Mary Magdalene. Mm. But certainly, yes, there was a favorite disciple that Jesus used to love. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you, Ralph. Okay. Right. Next one comes from Emil Mandrew, and he has asked, was the famine a pretext to prepare the way for the royal family to establish their Edessan kingdom in Jerusalem? Quite possibly, yeah. Um, again, there was lots of politics in this era. <laughs> People seem to disregard politics, you know, during the Roman era for some reason. They think Rome was all about um, military campaigns and there was no politics. There was plenty of politics within the Roman era. Um, and this would have been a perfect political play. Uh, we have a very rich and influential monarchy in the north, the Adesan Adiabeni royal family of Queen Helena and uh, King Abgarus. They became Jews. There was this whole episode of them becoming Nazarene Jews, um, specifically a Nazarene Jew, according to the Talmud. And they wanted to expand their influence. And there was a famine down in Judea. What better way of showing that you are the favored monarchy in that region than by giving famine relief money to the uh, to Judea. This would have been in AD 48, something like that, 49, um, during the reign of Claudius. But yeah, showing this great largesse, all this generosity towards uh, Judea, saving them from famine, and then going down to Jerusalem and donating the um, solid gold menorah to the temple, the big candlestick, um, building the largest palace down in Jerusalem, having the largest tomb in Jerusalem. All that happened, uh, as far as we know, all of that happened after this famine event. And so, yes, the Edessan royal family established themselves as the monarchs of Judea, the kings, um, well, at that time, it would have been the queen of the Jews. So um, Queen Helena became the de facto queen of the Jews at that time, with the biggest palace and the biggest tomb uh, in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, a palace that's only being excavated right now. It's called the uh, Giovanni parking lot uh, excavation. Oh dear because idea. even to this day, uh, the Israelis will not admit that they had a queen 
a very influential and powerful queen um, in the first century. And I, so I remember you telling the story. Sorry, Ralph. I remember you telling the story of um, going to uh, that part of the world and uh, yeah. ask, asking about Helena <laughs> and uh, getting a, a very sort of um, who on earth? She's a she's a mythical person. You know, she's a legend. She's not a real person. Yeah, and, no. Yeah. The, the guy didn't even know anything about. He had never heard of Queen Helena. This is the um, um, <clears throat> the immigration uh, officials in in uh, Tel Aviv, mm. and um, of course you have to have an interview before you come in, especially with my passport that had you know stamps from Algeria and you know Tunisia and Syria and various other places. Um, and so yeah. The guy said, why are you there? Why are you here in, in Israel? I said, to uh, uh, to look at the um, palace of Queen Helena. And he said, who? <laughs> He'd <laughs> never heard of her. So, uh, and he didn't believe me either. So eventually we had to get find a computer and, and Google up Queen Helena. <laughs> okay. Next question from Emil. Um, at what age was Paul uh, or Josephus Flavius thrown down with the basket outside the wall. If Aratus IV reigned in Nabatea until 49 AD, does it mean that Josephus Saul was 12 stroke 13 years old? And he's written, the, the Bar Mitzvah co Covenant was alive. Yeah, um, this is a contention. I don't think it's a very great contention because it stands out as like a sore thumb as being a, an interpolation in the text. Um, this is talking about uh, King Aretas um, when Saul was let down the walls of Damascus in a basket trying to escape. This was to do with King Aretas. He was escaping from King Aretas, I believe. Um, Let's just take the time to look it up. Um, <clears throat> so this is 2 Corinthians 11.32. <clears throat> and it, uh, it says, In Damascus, the ethnarch of Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes shut up, wishing to take me. This is wishing to capture Saul. Um, and through a window in a basket, I was let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Well, that doesn't make sense because Aretas never had control of Damascus. So there's a red flag for a starters. Um, and it doesn't fit in with the rest of the story. Um, the whole of the story before this is how people were persecuting poor old Saul, St. Paul. It's, it's terrible tragedy. You know, everybody hated him, not surprisingly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so what, what's it saying? Before this, it says, um, from the Jews, I was lashed 40 times. No, 39 times. There we go. Um, Three times I've been scourged. Once I've been stoned. Three times I've suffered, uh, suffered a shipwreck. Day and night I passed in the deep. Um, I had perils on rivers, perils by robbers, etc., etc. It goes on lamenting the poor time that Saul had. And then it says, um, and then it goes on to say in Damascus, the ethnarch Aretas, um, was wishing to take me. It sort of doesn't fit in with the rest of the chapter, and that is the end of the chapter. These are the last two verses in that chapter. They strike me as being in, an interpolation that's been put on the end of that chapter, because it doesn't really make um, it doesn't really finish that chapter very well. It doesn't make sense. And Aretas was never the king of Damascus. So I don't think that is, I think it's out of context. It's, it's got the wrong chronology. It's been added on to the end of that particular chapter. Um, it would have ended much better with verse 31 that says, 
because verse 31 really sums up the end of this chapter. Um, verse 30 says, if it is needed to boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity, the things that happened to me. And 31 says, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus knows he who is blessed forever that I do not lie. End of chapter. And then it starts talking about Aretas. It's, mm. it's an interpolation that's been uh, put on to the end. Um, because the mention of Aretas is completely out chronologically. Because Aretas died in the 30s. Let me quickly look that up. Um, And so it's a bit of a, a problem. Um, so which Aretas is he? I think he's Aretas the fourth, isn't he? Philopatris? Yeah. Yep. I think he's Aretas the fourth. Um, he died in AD 40. So it's very, very difficult for this um, verse to be talking about Saul. Um, especially in my version of Saul, where, where Saul wasn't born until AD 37. Um, and so this particular verse is completely out of context, it's out of chronology, and it doesn't really fit into that chapter. Um, but I mean, it's a good question, because these are the sort of questions that have to be asked and answered, um, because... when giving a new chronology as i've done to the gospel story you have to check to see if all of that chronology works and it works in i would say 90 percent of occasions it works there are only a couple of occasions um really where it doesn't work one is obviously the mention of pontius pilate which has obviously been fitted in because it has to be Pontius Pilate uh, to be the AD 30s. And, and B is occasionally the Roman emperors. If you read the uh, Doctrine of Adi, um, they, use, um, they use the emperor from the AD 30s, not Claudius, they use the previous one, um, because it has to be that particular emperor to suit the classical uh, crucifixion of uh, Jesus. But the thing with the doctrine of Adai is while they use the correct emperor, they've used the wrong um, governor of Syria. They used uh, a governor of Syria from the AD 50s. So there's a dichotomy there as well. But yeah, good question, that one. Very good. Um, yeah, very good. And he's followed up with this. I've got to read this off my phone. Um, <clears throat> Based on the premise that during the time of Tiberius, the pro procurator, all this would have happened when the Great Famine occurred. Do you think Tiberius caused all this? I have the courage to believe this. Why am I saying this? Because it is possible that Izartes Manu was set up together with Tiberius because they were childhood friends. They grew up at, a, at the court of King Ab. Nerg, A B double N E R I G, Benerig, yes, Benerig, sorry. Who was who was who was Anatonia Minor? She was the mother of Emperor Claudius, and this one was close friends with Helena. Both had converted to Judaism. Now, if Alabark Alexander was Anatonia's manager. And I think he could have been Helena's supplier too in the decoration of the temple with gold. Who could be Tiberius Alexander? Not if he was one of the friends of his artes. Now, if Josephus Flavius is straining the language when he says that the famine happened in the time of Tiberius in 46 to 48 AD, and Josephus is sure of what he says, why not think that Tiberius was the welcome bait thrown by Claudius in the court of Jerusalem? 
causing the greater uh, sorry causing the great famine because it is only clear that Josephus seems to be the only one to blame uh, he Tiberius would be to blame in this whole problem so um needs to be a, a little more succinct uh yeah. i think for anyone that's asking questions um, i think i think he's spanish guy and i think he's, he's doing his best in english i think right but it, it, it's it's rather too all-encompassing yeah. um all i can say is yes there are interesting elements in that and i recognize some of the arguments he's trying to make um but a couple of things to to bear in mind for all of these chronological pro problems um <clears throat> the first one is that if this um if this history has been forced back by 40 years which i believe it has this is the chronological chasm so the events happened in ad uh, 68 to 70 but vespasian didn't want anyone to know that these events were involved in the Jewish revolt. So he forced all of this history back into AD 26 to AD 30, the classical era of the biblical Jesus. This has caused many distortions within the uh, chronology of the Gospels and some of the history that is related to the Gospels. And so you do get some um, strange oddities um like we've discussed with the uh, doctrine of adai has two different dates for <laughs> for the same event basically um they would have to mention tiberius because that's the classical emperor for the classical date of the gospel era um tiberius died in ad 37 so anything to do with uh, jesus would have to be under emperor tiberius um, but he was probably around during the reign of Claudius. Claudius reigned until AD 54. Now, Claudius was the emperor who was around during the famine, as far as we know. So the famine could have been at any time uh, in the 40s, all the way up to AD 54. It could have been up to AD 54. Um, and the other problem with the chronology that comes out of this is is the age of Saul now they say that Saul uh, was born in AD 20 or some even say AD 10 but there is no evidence for that whatsoever there is no birth date for Saul they simply say that because he went on his uh, evangelical tours in the early AD 50s and they assume he had to be an adult. But of course, he was an adult. He was 14, 15 years old. So he was born actually in AD 37 because he was Josephus Flavius. Um, as you probably know, I uh, conflate Saul with Josephus Flavius. Um, Josephus would have been 15 years old in AD 52. And so he was a man when he went on his first evangelical tour he was just a rather a young man um and people have disregarded that for some reason which is odd because ev evangelists today if they go out on these tours you know especially from america they don't send out adults on these tours they send out children you might get you know one of 19 years old and one of sort of 16 years old you get a couple of teenagers uh, maybe some people in their 20s you send out youngsters on these tours before they have the responsibility of having a family uh, and having to earn money to maintain that family and so it's youngsters that go out on these tours so i don't think there is actually um a problem with the new chronology with the chronology of Jesus being in the AD 60s. Mm. I think that chronology works rather well, and it explains all of the oddities that the classical um, chronology does not explain. Um, things like, you know, Jesus 
describing the siege of Jerusalem and things of that nature, which we talked about before. Mm. So I think there are more problems in the AD 30s chronology than there are in the AD 60s chronology. The latter makes more, more mm. sense. Um, and a lot of people are actually coming to agree with me on this, you know, um, uh, at will and valiant and so on, they're all now homing in on the, um, what do they call it? The Roman provenance theory that the gospel story was influenced by, um, Roman authors and uh, perhaps even events, uh, in Rome that they were written down the, these gospel stories in the, Jewish revolt era, which is exactly actually how classical historians think as well. You know, most of these gospels are said to be, have been written in the AD 70s. And all they're doing is saying, well, actually this was written in the AD 70s because there was lots of Roman influence on these stories. It's known as Roman provenance. Well, my Edessa theory is Roman provenance, writ large. It's all because it was um, it was organized by Vespasian. Vespasian wanted this story, and it was written by Josephus Flavius for the Romans, because the Romans wanted to quell any further revolts in the East. And what the Romans wanted was a Rome-friendly form of Judaism. And Saul's Judaism for Gentiles was perfectly mm. suited for this event. And this Judaism for Gentiles became what we know as Christianity. So the, the chronology actually works very well. And I think that answers some of, of his questions there. Yeah, it does. Brilliant. Um, just going back to Saul Josephus, when he went on his evangelical tour, didn't he go with somebody else? Was it an older brother? Yeah, he, he probably, well, he went with um, with Barnabas. Yes. And uh, for many reasons, I think that Barnabas was his elder brother. Mm. Um, I link them together because they're both, uh, they both are named after stars. Bit complicated to, um, to explain here, but I explain it in the books. Uh, Barnabas was also called Bar Sabbas. And Bar Sabbas means the son of the star. So they all had sort of star in their name. <clears throat> so did John the Baptist even. In one of his names was linked to stars. And um, this is the same as Bar Kokhba, of course, from the Bar Kokhba uprising. He was also called the son of the star. That's why I think Bar Sabbas actually means the son of the star. Um, it's taken from the Egyptian. Um, a lot of uh, theologians don't take this into account because they don't fully understand that Judaism came out of Egypt. But anyway, uh, Saba or Sabas or Sheba in Egyptian means the star. So Bar Sabas is the son of the son of the star, the same as Bar Kokhba. Um, so I think Barnabas was the older brother of. Uh, Saul. And that's why they were on this tour together, because they were brothers. One was older. Uh, Barnabas was the older brother. Uh, little Saul was the uh, younger brother. And off they went on these evangelical tours. And um, we, we know that uh, Barnabas was the elder brother because he was called Jupiter, whereas uh, Saul was called Mercury, the fiery little Mercury. So he was quite obviously the younger brother of the two. Mm. Brilliant. Okay, I think we've only got one question left. I'm just going to check very quickly because I hate the idea of missing anybody out. <laughs> Once again, thank you, everyone, so much for these questions. I, I really enjoy doing these shows with Ralph. Mm. Um, they're uh, really entertaining for viewers, and the questions have been absolutely excellent. If I have missed anyone out, I'm really sorry. I do apologise. Please let me know if I have, and I'll rectify that uh, the next time we do one um but the final question comes from me ralph and the question <laughs> is who was king azizas of emesa in the works of josephus flavius 
And what was his relationship with King Azates of Adiabene, Adiabene Edessa? Yeah, we, we have these two monarchies. And again, this is um, work in progress, you might say. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yes, yeah, some of my critics don't even believe that there were two monarchies. They were they were trying to mock this uh, suggestion, which, which is a bit odd because, the, I mean, they're fairly well known from real history that there were two monarchies in this region that sound rather similar. So we have the Edessan monarchy of, as you say, Isartes or Isis was the short name. And then we have the Emesan, so not the Edessan, but the Emesan monarchy, uh, a little bit further south. and. Um, their one of their kings was uh, Azizus, wasn't it? Azizus, yep. very very similar name. Sounds like a, a similar family from a similar background with similar names, um, and they both had their own independent monarchies in this region, in this era, in the first century. One was up in the north at Odessa, which is now mo modern uh, San Lerfa, basically at Gobekli Tepe. If you can find that on a map, then you know where it is. And the second one was uh, Emesa, which is down at Homs and Hammer. Now, if they were related, they weren't always on friendly terms because they did have a battle. Um, this was in the AD... 50s i think it was yes so i'm just going to share the uh, the passage mm -hmm. written by josephus on screen so people can have a look at this as well all right is that big enough to read i can't read it at present um i can uh, read it. yes if you've got any pertinent points you can read out in that yeah okay uh yeah oh hold on a minute i'm just going to try and lose me <laughs> if i leave the cursor alone because it's blocking part of the passage at the moment. Can, can you highlight it with the cursor at all? Any particular passages? Uh, Will it highlight? Let me just see quickly. If I go to... Um, can you see my cursor on the uh, screen at all? I can't, but I've only got a very small picture here. I, I can't get it full screen, so I've only got a very small image. Right, okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll read out the passage... Uh, from my end so okay it says now when the king's brother monobazus and his other kindred saw how his artes, by his piety to god was become greatly esteemed by all men they also had a desire to leave the religion of their country and to embrace the customs of the jews mm -hmm. but that act of theirs was discovered by his artes's subjects whereupon the grandees were much displeased and could not contain their anger at them, but had an intention when they should find a proper opportunity to inflict a punishment upon them. Accordingly, they wrote to Abia, king of the Arabians, and promised him great sums of money if he would make an expedition against their king. And they further promised him that on the first onset, they would desert their king because they were desirous to punish him by reason of the hatred he had to their religious worship. Then they obliged themselves by oaths to be faithful to each other and desired that he would make haste in this design. The king of Arabia compiled with their desires and brought a great army into the field and marched against Isartes. And in the beginning of the first onset and before they came to a close fight, those handies as if they had a panic terror upon them, all deserted his artes, as they had agreed to do, and turning their backs upon their enemies, ran away. Yet not was his artes dismayed at this, but when he understood that the grandees had betrayed him, he also retired into his camp and made inquiry into the matter. As soon as he knew who they were that had made this conspiracy with the king of Arabia, he cut off those that were found guilty, and renewing the fight on the next day, he slew the greatest part of his enemies, and forced all the rest to betake themselves to flight. He also pursued their king, and drove him into a fortress called Arsamus, and following on the siege vigorously, 
he took that fortress. And when he had plundered it all of the prey that was in it, which was not small, he returned to Adiabeni. Yet he did not take Abia alive, because when he found himself encompassed on every side, he slew himself. That's the, the first paragraph. Yeah, uh, yes. and then it goes on to mention Azizus, doesn't it? Um, well, Azizus is Abia. Ah, is that not correct? Yes, that's from a different translation. I forget where we got that, but there is a different mention that says Abia is Azizus, isn't there? I'll have to look up because I, I wrote a little a small paper on this. I'll have to look up exactly what it said. But it's interesting that this uh, is to do with the conversion of the Edessans to Judaism again. Um, so this is the same as the Council of Jerusalem, which was all about converting people up in Antioch into Judaism. And remember, uh, Edessa was known as Antioch. So it was known as Antioch Edessa. Um, it's the same as the doctrine of Adai, which was also about um, <clears throat> ambassadors shuttling backwards and forwards from Judea to Edessa. It's the same as Josephus' other passage, um, because he often writes in this fashion where we have duplicate passages, parallel passages. And he writes another passage very similar about the Adiabenans, um, how they were being converted into Judaism. Um, the, the same as the gospel story, the, the story in Acts of the Apostles, there was a, a, a moderate um, apostle who said you don't need circumcision. And then there was a more hardline uh, apostle, uh, Elizar, who said they must have uh, circumcision. And this story is all about the problems of this circumcision, that if the king of Edessa circumcised himself, then his people would revolt against him. And that's why these people made this deal with Emesa, just to the south, that they would desert the king and join the Emesan king against their own king. This was all to do with his circumcision, that he was going to become a Nazarene Jew. Uh, and we know this happened because the Talmud says so. Um, so we have like four different accounts uh, of this same event, this conversion of the Edessans to Nazarene Judaism. And this is just one of them. And this has a little bit of extra information because it says that they were therefore involved in this uh, revolt and this, this war with the Emesans, who were down, as I say, just at just below Damascus at Homs and Hammer in modern Syria, uh, where this alternative um, independent monarchy used to reign. A monarchy who was very, very similar to the Edessans because they had the same names and they were they had intermarriages as well. So you, you can tell that they were linked. Um, and yet this Emesan uh, monarchy has largely sort of disappeared from history again. This is another of these small monarchies that's uh, disappeared. Um, and I think what needs to be done is we need to bring them back into the, the limelight a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I've already done that with Edessa because nobody seemed to know about Edessa before I started talking about them. Uh, literally, there were a couple of academic books on Edessa that nobody read. And that was it. And nobody had ever dreamt that this monarchy was somehow linked uh, to the gospel story. But I think that's just um, historical blindness or maybe theological blindness, blindness, I don't know, because it's pretty obvious they were linked. Um, when we go back to that uh, famine relief money passage in Acts of the Apostles, um, that famine relief money was sent by Agabus who is obviously King Agbarus of Edessa. Um, and we know that because the famine relief money was sent by, sent by Queen Helena. Uh, Josephus Flavius says so. Um, but Queen Helena was married to K 
King Abgarus. It is the same famine relief money. Um, it is the money that came from Adiabeni Edessa. The problem with that is that money was taken to Judea by Saul and Barnabas, our two favorite evangelists. And so this is direct evidence that Saul and Barnabas were ambassadors of the Edessa royal family. That's why they were taking their money down to Judea. And that puts Saul center stage into the Edessa monarchy, that he was the ambassador of Edessa, taking their money down to Judea for this famine relief money. Um, and that means that Edessa is center, center stage in the gospel story. And yet that's never been highlighted before uh, until I came along with my Jesus King of Edessa. And still people are resisting it, of course. You, everybody has seen the, the great resistance to the introduction of Edessa into this story. But it's something that makes a great deal of sense. But sitting on the bottom of that story, we have the kingdom of Emesa. And they must have been linked into this story as well because they became um, very prominent in the I'm just thinking which which era in the third century the early third century um, when some of their princes became emperor of Rome hmm. so we had Septimus Severus we had Emperor Elagabalus um, who was sponsored by the very famous and the very influential Julia Domna, who was a very powerful queen uh, from this region, from Emesa, from Syria. And she managed to get one of her nephews, I think he was, um, to become the next emperor of Rome. This was Emperor Elagabalus, uh, who was the uh, high priest of the Elagabal stone, the sacred stone that we have talked about before. So this monarchy down towards the south, near Damascus, near Homs and Hammer, suddenly became very prominent in the early third century in a very similar fashion to how the Edessan monarchy became very prominent uh, in the first century. So I do think there are links between these um, two royal families. And uh, that's something that needs to be studied further and mm -hmm. um yeah we we should get some interesting results perhaps from that i don't know fingers crossed yeah hopefully um there's uh i mean some of these kings here don't even have their own wiki page there's there's very little known about some of them very is... little has been written about msa in the um classical sort of history uh of the region because i don't think there's very much data there especially for the first century there is more for the third century mm. when they became a bit more famous mm. um but in the first century there's very little data so there's very little to go on it's always the the problem with um deciphering history is we is we're dealing with scraps sometimes scraps of information that are coming our way is and that sometimes... deliberate ralph? sorry ralph is that deliberate yep. do you think I, in some respects yes of course it is yeah um some of it is just lost because of, you know, wars and revolts and uh, civil wars and whatever, like the burning of the library at, um, uh, at Alexandria. But that was semi-deliberate as well, because they knew that that library uh, contradicted the uh, Catholic Church, and therefore they wanted rid of it. Mm. So, um, the, you know, libraries like that are dangerous to many people. And they, it was obviously dangerous towards the Catholic Church. Um, but many people contend against, you know, histories that they don't like. Josephus Flavius did exactly the same. He hated the, uh, uh, the history of Judea by Justice of Tiberius, which detailed the same history that he was writing himself, but from a different perspective. And Josephus Flavius hated it. He said it was a tissue of lies. You know, Justus of Tiberius didn't know what he was talking about. Hmm. 
And of course, we don't have that chronicle. It's gone. And we would have loved to have seen what Justice was writing about these same events, because we know that Josephus is not always telling the truth. He was um, he was writing for Rome, so he was writing from a Roman perspective, uh, with a Roman bias. And of course, Justice of Tiberius may have been writing from an alternate perspective. And so we might get this same dichotomy between the works of Josephus and uh, um, Moses of Corinne from Syria, um, who disagrees or rather has a different viewpoint to Josephus. So, you know, when Josephus, we've spoken about this before, so I won't go through it. When Josephus talks about um, <clears throat> fugitives from Syria helping King Aretas of Petra, he's not telling us the full truth. He's just saying fugitives from Syria. But Moses of Corinne says that was the Edessan army that was helping Aretas. Mm. And so, yeah, now here we get the different perspective. We get a different story. Mm. Um, and that's an interesting one as well, because we know why Aretas was upset uh, with uh, King Herod, Herod Agrippa. Um, this was in the AD 30s, probably about AD 30 or AD 34, something like this. Um, King Aretas was upset with uh, Herod Agrippa because his daughter had been spurned. But why were the Edessan army down there helping, um, helping King Aretas? Well, the only other thing that happened at this very time that was involved in this very same dispute was the beheading of John the Baptist, mm. who complained about this illegal marriage. That's why he got beheaded. It directly implies that the Edessan army was down there because of the beheading of John the Baptist. And therefore, John the Baptist was most probably linked, closely linked, to the Edessan royal family again. Again, it means that the Edessan royal family was center stage uh, on this gospel story. Yeah, I was just about to ask you, was John the Baptist Edessan? Was he a Messon? Where did he come from? Yeah, well, we don't know, of course, but um, here we have direct evidence that he must have been connected to the Edessan royal family otherwise their army wouldn't have come down to punish king um agrippa herod agrippa for the beheading of john the baptist he must have been linked somehow to that edessan royal family the only problem is of course the name john doesn't help us you know we need more names all of these monarchs and princes had more than one name we need another um, title or name, John the Baptist, uh, cannot be found within the Edessan records. So we, we don't know who he was. Be careful though, Ralph, because if you start giving John the Baptist other names, people will get very angry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, unfortunately, he does have other names. He has another name. If you go down to the um, uh, oh gosh, who are they called? The uh, Marsh Arabs down in. Uh, um, in modern Iraq, in Mesopotamia. Oh. <clears throat> anyway, Kurds. the Kurds was it Kurds? No, they're not the Kurds. It's, it's another group, but they they tend to venerate John the Baptist, hmm. and uh, they have another name for John the Baptist. So he does have, have other names, and the other name uh, means the star. Um, I, I forget that particular part of the story, but anyway, that's in my book. Um, king jesus so people can look it up and have a look at that history mm. brilliant it the well, manians uh, it might have been the manians i don't know yeah. anyway we can look that up later and, and okay. trouble is you see my books are so vast i've forgotten <laughs> yeah. half of what i've put in these books because they are so large um and um yes even i'm amazed when i go through these books sometimes you know because i read the book and i think wow that's really brilliant who wrote that 
<laughs> that was me, wasn't it? <laughs> because I've, you know, there are so many smaller sides in these books. I've actually forgotten what I've written. It's hardly um, surprising. How, how many pages is the Grail Cipher? Is it 600? Uh, Grail Cipher is 600. Jesus, yeah. uh, King of Edessa is 600. King Jesus is about 500. Yeah. So yeah. fairly extensive uh, books. And well referenced as well all the references are mm. there but uh, normally i'm referencing the original manuscripts i don't reference um other historians whether modern or venerable i don't tend to look at their work because you get too skewed by their mm. their own conclusions and judgments so i don't read their books i I tend to go straight back to the original manuscripts and make my own interpretations of mm. what it was actually saying. Um, I think that's a more reliable way of doing it. Well, I think that's proved very fruitful for you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes oh, it's but... certainly a, a different interpretation of the first century, that's for sure. Mm. Yes, and one that makes a lot more sense to me. Um, <laughs> shall, we, shall we leave it there? All the yeah, I think that's uh, wrapped it up just about, unless... Uh, Anyone is commenting at the, the current time? Oh, we're yeah. not live, are we? On this no, show? we're not live today. Oh, no, we're not live. I am thinking about doing a live maybe next year, a Q&A, and, and maybe do it live. Mm. Um, but uh, we'll see what happens. I think yeah, this is, is um, our last video of the year, and it's my last video of the year as well. So um, happy, happy holiday season to everyone out there. A very, very happy new year to you all. We're living through very difficult times at the moment. So... I hope that all the viewers, subscribers have a, a wonderful new year mm. and things start looking up, generally speaking, for, for everyone. And uh, thank you, Ralph, for coming on the channel so many times this year and sharing your vast knowledge on all these subjects. I'm very, very grateful, mate. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure, Paul. Always good to be uh, on the show. And yes, uh, to everyone celebrating, uh, have a happy Manu Mass. Or is it Isus Mass? One of the two, anyway. It's either Manu Mass. Manu Mass. Isus <laughs> Manu Mass. Yeah, brilliant. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, happy holidays, and we'll all see you on the other side next year. Brilliant. Okay. Please like, share, and subscribe, everyone. Thank you for watching. All the best. Cheers. <laughs>